Good morning, guys. It's good to see everybody on a cold Monday morning. Um, this, is the, uh, this is the Dr. Phil side of my job. Consistent with the theme of being present, we're going to talk about being present in our sexuality today. And I have to admit that I am a little bit anxious about this talk for obvious reasons, but I want you to know it is a talk that I wanted to lead us in because I think it's incredibly important. And one of the things that I want you to hear me say on the front end is please know that this is coming only from a perspective and a standpoint of caring about you and this community. This is not a talk that I want to talk down to you or talk about rules or what we expect of behavior except from the standpoint of caring about your well-being and you being able to experience God's full favor in your life. And so I ask that you will give me grace if I say something that may initially hit you as inappropriate or come across the wrong way. It was not intended that way. But I do think that this is a conversation that we need to have. And we probably need to have it often because of what's taking place in our society. I want to start by looking a little bit at how our society and the cultural norms what they say around sexuality. So there was a recent study of sex in America from 18 to 29-year-olds that were surveyed. And they were specifically asked, what are your views on sexuality? One of the specific questions was, do you think that it's okay to have sex before marriage? So that was in 2006, they charted a response. Roughly 50% of those 18 to 29-year-olds said, yeah, I think it's okay. By 2016, 10 years later, that number had risen to 65%. And then in 2018, there was a study of Generation Z, which is basically anyone born 1999 to like 2015. So in essence, it's the 15 to 19 year olds in this same window. That number jumped up to 80% of roughly 15 to 19 year olds surveyed said, yeah, I think it's okay to have sex before you're married. Certainly, we're seeing, and you guys know this, the views around sexuality and what society accepts as okay have changed, and they continue to change. There's an author named Jean Twenge, in a 2017 book that she suggests that traditional dating among young people, and that's you, has been replaced by a pervasive hookup culture in which relationships are few and far between, but sex is all too common. She talks about how in the study there were two major findings. One was that sex was not that big of a deal. The other was that sex was the only thing that mattered in a relationship. So try to reconcile that, if you will. It points to an evolving culture that puts sex at the center but diminishes the importance of an emotional relationship and connection that take place between two people. According to American Hookup, which is a book by Lisa Wade, 2016, the average college senior has hooked up eight times during college. One-third of college students haven't hooked up at all. She also describes how hookups are predicated on emotional indifference. And that the worst thing, she says, that you can get called on a college campus is desperate. Being clingy. Acting as if you need someone is considered pathetic. Social scientists from... Indiana University said, I have students who say that people should be able to have sex without any emotion, and if you can't, there's something wrong with you. A new term that I didn't know, the very concept of catching feelings for someone promotes the idea that it's a shameful thing, similar to being sick. Many studies as a follow-on to this also point out the pervasive role that alcohol plays in casual sex. 
It's noted in one study, the fear of intimacy of really showing yourself is one reason why hookups always occur when both parties have been drinking. Alcohol allows students to pretend that sex doesn't mean anything. After all, you were both drunk. Yet I would want to point out to you guys that 80% of your peers still point to the fact that marriage is an important part of your life plans. Sometimes to me, as I look around and read and watch what's taking place, it feels a bit like that sex has replaced God as ultimate in our society. So what are the impacts of our sexual activity outside of marriage? 2014 study revealed that men and women reporting multiple sexual partners had lower satisfaction with marriage. A study done at Cal State University in the Journal of Sex Research found that those engaging in casual sex have a lower sense of well-being and a greater chance of experiencing anxiety and depression. 2002 study, sex before marriage is associated with a significant elevated risk of divorce. Women who have their first sexual experience in their teens are twice as likely to experience divorce than females who wait until their adult years to experience sex. Those who have been sexually active before marriage are more likely to be unfaithful in their marriage. 2013 study, increasing numbers of sexual partners are associated with increasing risk of substance abuse and dependence. 2014 study, among college-age students engaging in casual sex is associated with elevated risk of psychological distress. It's a quote from a researcher at at Focus on the Family, David Stanton, that I love, and it says this. When we give ourselves away, and sex is a full giving of ourselves away, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, to someone outside the commitment and protection of marriage, it breaks down an important part of us, making our future relationships more unhealthy and difficult to sustain. I think he's exactly right. And that's a hard reality. You know, there's a reason that all of these things that I've mentioned to you and so many more are true. It's because God did not intend for us to have sex outside of marriage. God gave us our sexuality as a beautiful and amazing gift. But like most things in life that are so powerful and influential, when pursued carelessly and recklessly, they're so incredibly dangerous. God never intended for sex to be a mere physical act where we separate our body from our minds and our souls. We're reminded of that in 1 Corinthians 6. It talks about our body and how we should honor God with them. And we're shown that our bodies, our physical being is such an incredibly important part of our spiritual journey. That's God's design. And in Scripture, Scripture only affirms sexual activity within a marriage. That's it. It's the only place where our sexuality is affirmed. Regardless of what new cultural norms or what becomes accepted by society and how that changes, 
It's not going to change. It hasn't changed what God calls us to do and be in the world relative to our sexuality. Guys, I can't tell you how many times in my nine years of being president of this institution I have watched your peers, some of you here in this audience today, see your lives crash and leave a stream of carnage behind you. Pain that sinks to the deepest part of who you are because of the choices that you or those close to you have made around your sexuality. Life altering choices. Some of which you may not experience the full effects of for another 15 or 20 years. Guys, this needs to change. I get you may be listening to me thinking, yeah, you don't understand. No, I do understand. We need a higher standard as a community for how we hold each other accountable and walk with each other. We've got to send a message to everybody that's here and all those that you run with and walk with each day. Be willing to talk about this. Be willing to sit and say, hey, I want to talk about Dr. Schubert's message today. How do we feel about that? What are we going to do to hold each other accountable and allow ourselves to make good decisions so that we don't end up in a place that God never intended us to be. Succumbing to the urges of our selfishness instead of exercising the discipline that he calls us in almost every other aspect of life as Christians to not conform ourselves to the way of the world. I'm not sure where this message may find you today. Maybe this isn't your struggle. Maybe it's the biggest struggle of your life. One thing that I know with absolute certainty is that God loves you. And more importantly than that, he loves us where we are, not where we ought to be. And so if you don't hear me say anything else, hear this. I don't care what you have done, what you have said, or what you have thought. Nothing can separate you from God's love for you. As we're reminded in Psalm 23, God pursues us every single day. Every single day. He longs for another opportunity to get a little closer, to understand us a little better, to have us open ourselves to him so that he can work powerfully in our lives, revealing to us the plan that he has for who he's called us to be and the difference that we can make in the world. Every single day, he will not tire. He will not grow faint. He will never stop pursuing us. And so I don't care where this message finds you. How about opening the door in this part of your life to recommit yourself to lead a life that God calls you to lead and help someone else sitting next to you, walking with you in your dorm, on your team, to do the same thing by being willing to talk about it. I love you guys and all the faculty and staff and coaches, administrators that serve here love you so much. There's nothing that pains us more than to see you find yourself in a place that you never expected to be with the kind of pain and difficulty that you can't even describe to somebody. Know that we're praying for you each and every step of the way. I'd leave you with this. 
My prayer for all of you in this domain is that you'll find courage in who God has made you to be. God created every one of us. He knows us, and he knows what is good for us. So my prayer for you is that you'll trust the design of God because you trust the heart of God.